Why is the eFAST important? Within minutes, this exam prioritizes the broad differential posed by an unstable trauma. For instance, take a negative eFAST. A negative eFAST cuts this list in half, leaving four things, four things that can often be prioritized using other physical exam findings, often limiting the list to just two, pelvic fracture or retroperitoneal bleed. What do they have in common? Angio. Powerful, all while the team is situating the patient and EMS is giving report. FAST is included under the C of the APCs performed on an unstable trauma. Today, we will cover the performance of the five EFAST views. This will include the identification of hemoperitoneum, hemopericardium, hemothorax, and pneumothorax. Exam pitfalls will be discussed. Some ground rules. First, this exam is designed to detect large hemoperitoneum. That said, smaller amounts of fluid can sometimes be appreciated. A negative FAST does not rule out all significant abdominal trauma. For this, consider a CT. Second, the FAST can't differentiate between types of fluid. Keep in mind alternate sources, such as ascites or peritoneal distillate, when evaluating for hemoperitoneum. There are five FAST views to cover. The right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, pelvis, cardiac views, either subxiphoid or parasternal, and lung windows. We'll take on each view individually. The entire exam is typically performed from the patient's right side, starting with the right upper quadrant. To hold the probe, I suggest you place the probe on top of your fingers, wrapping your thumb over the top or wide portion of the probe. This allows you to stabilize the radial side of your hand against the patient. Position the probe mid-axillary line below the costal margin, indicator towards the patient's head, probe face aimed back towards the spine. In this right upper quadrant position, you're obtaining a coronal view. So the ultrasound beam is slicing through the patient from their right side toward their left to produce the image on the screen. You can place your probe along the mid-axillary line because the liver is a large imaging window, as seen in the lower right. Orienting to what we should see, the liver appears at the top of the screen, closest to the probe. Moving more midline, the kidney appears in the middle of the screen. And then the spine appears at the bottom of the screen, furthest from the probe. The diaphragm appears as a bright white line above the liver. Lateral diaphragm here, medial diaphragm here. When scanning, fan through the entire quadrant so as to not miss more subtle findings. Remember you're only imaging a thin slice at any given time. In the right upper quadrant, look for fluid in two locations. First, between the liver and kidney in Morrison's pouch. Second, above the diaphragm, actually in the right thorax where hemothorax would collect. Let's now look at some clips showing the pathology we're looking for. In this clip, we see the classic positive Morrison's pouch. Here, black fluid is collected between the liver and kidney. A more subtle clip. Fluid again is seen in Morrison's pouch, but here the fluid appears as a thin black slice between the liver and kidney. A larger collection occurs at the inferior pole of the kidney. What about a hemothorax? What does fluid above the diaphragm look like? The left film clip shows a collection of fluid above the diaphragm with a piece of collapsed lung floating in it. The spine or posterior rib cage, depending on your scan angle, appears as a white line behind this fluid collection. Seeing this white line clues you into the hemothorax. Why? The right film clip shows a normal lung. If the chest is air filled, you will not see this white line. Ultrasound does not image through air. Thus, you cannot image through the air to see posterior structures. No spine or posterior rib cage is seen. This clip demonstrates a small volume hemothorax. It appears above the diaphragm on the left of the screen as a black fluid collection. The posterior rib cage or vertebral bodies, depending on your scan angle, appear behind it. 
Here is a challenge clip. Can you make out what's going on? This clip captures two things, a hemothorax and a positive Morrison's pouch view. There are pitfalls to imaging the right upper quadrant. One of the most common is visualizing a segment of the IVC medial to the liver and above the kidney and mistaking it as free fluid. Free fluid, on the other hand, will usually wrap around the kidney. If you put on color Doppler, blood flow will appear within the IVC. The second most common pitfall, the gallbladder, may be encountered if you scan way anterior. The gallbladder can be recognized by its location, also by it being an isolated structure encased by a white wall. Moving to the next view, the left upper quadrant, to hold the probe, rest it on top of your fingers and wrap your thumb on top of the probe. Here you're stabilizing the ulnar side of your hand against the patient. The probe is now placed towards the patient's back, along the posterior axillary line. Indicator, towards the patient's head. The hand should be against the stretcher. Probe held parallel to the stretcher. Face of the probe even aims slightly toward the stretcher. If the image isn't optimal, Try going up a rib space or spinning your probe slightly counterclockwise to fit between the ribs. In the left upper quadrant position, you're again obtaining a coronal view. The ultrasound beam is slicing through the patient from their left side toward their right to produce the image on the screen. Looking at the right upper image, the probe is placed more cephalad than in the right upper quadrant because the spleen offers a smaller sonographic window. Looking at the right lower image, the probe is also placed more posterior than in the right upper quadrant to avoid the air-filled stomach. Angling the probe anterior will compromise your image. Easy to do when reaching over a large patient. In this image, we see the spleen at the top of the screen, closest to the probe. Moving more midline, the kidney appears in the middle of the screen, and then the spine appears at the bottom. The diaphragm appears as a bright white line above the spleen. Lateral diaphragm here, medial diaphragm here. When scanning, fan through the entire quadrant so as not to miss more subtle findings. There are three locations to look for fluid. First, above the diaphragm, a hemothorax. Second, between the spleen and diaphragm. Unlike on the right, where the liver is adhered to the diaphragm, the spleen is not adhered to the diaphragm. This allows blood to preferentially pool here. Diaphragmatic excursions create a negative vacuum actively pulling fluid into the space. Third, blood can collect to a lesser degree between the spleen and kidney. Let's review some pathologic clips. Here's a positive left upper quadrant. A black fluid strip appears between the diaphragm and spleen, but note, there's really no fluid between the spleen and kidney. Seeing the diaphragm-spleen interface is critical to not missing fluid. This is a slightly harder clip. Can you make out all the areas of concern? A small collection of fluid appears between the spleen and kidney, and between the spleen and diaphragm and then a larger collection appears above the diaphragm, a hemothorax. Here's another challenge, harder than our last one. Can you make out what's going on in this left upper quadrant? Not easy. Here fluid is present between the spleen and retroperitoneum. Then towards the bottom of the screen is a kidney with its architecture disrupted due to a severe laceration, and then there's actually fluid collected around the kidney in the retroperitoneum. This fluid highlights the white fascia that exists between the abdomen and retroperitoneum, a structure we usually don't notice. This fascia divides the retroperitoneum, where the kidney lives, from the intra-abdominal cavity where the spleen lives, and on rare occasions, like this one, is highlighted when a substantial renal bleed occurs. The most common pitfall in the left upper quadrant is imaging a fluid-filled stomach and mistaking it for free fluid. Note the peristaltic movement, air bubbles, and the thick surrounding wall of the stomach. Use a nasogastric tube to drain the stomach and then rescan if you're in doubt. The pelvic view. 
To obtain this view, grasp the probe low down, pressing the heel of the hand against the patient. Hold the probe like a pencil. Place the probe just above the pubic symphysis well below the umbilicus, indicator towards the patient's head. The probe face may even be angled inferiorly into the pelvis to enhance your view. This view is best accomplished with a full bladder. An empty bladder may decrease your ability to see small fluid collections and should be noted as a limitation. Orienting to what we should see. This is a sagittal view. The ultrasound beam is slicing through the patient from the anterior to posterior abdomen to produce the image on the screen. Thus, anterior abdomen appears at the top of the screen, closest to the probe. Posterior abdomen appears at the bottom of the screen, furthest from the probe. Left of the screen is cephalad, right of the screen is caudal. In this male image, the shadow generated by the pubic symphysis is seen all the way to the right. The bladder is in the middle of the screen. The seminal vesicles appear behind the bladder on the right. The peritoneum runs cephalad to the bladder and then comes around to enclose the retroperitoneum. The peritoneum separates the abdominal cavity from the structures of the pelvis. The bladder is in the pelvis. Fluid from the abdomen will flow inferiorly until it reaches the peritoneum. It will then pool, filling the posterior cul-de-sac. The peritoneum keeps the fluid from running more caudal into the pelvis. The female pelvis. The orientation is exactly the same. The bladder is seen in the middle of the screen. Uterus is cephalad with its fundus arching anteriorly over the bladder. Vagina is located behind the bladder and on the right. The vagina and uterus taken together essentially form a collapsible chair that the bladder sits in. In the female, the peritoneum runs over the uterus and bladder and then comes around to encase the retroperitoneum. The bladder and uterus are in the pelvis. Fluid from the abdomen will again flow inferiorly until it hits the peritoneum. It will then stop and pool, filling the posterior cul-de-sac. Moving to some pathology. Here's a positive female pelvis. Bladders in the middle of the screen with its smooth contours. Uterus is left and posterior to the bladder. Its fundus arching anteriorly. Vagina is right and posterior to the bladder. Free fluid is present in the abdomen to the left of the uterus. Notice how the fluid makes sharp angles as it interfaces with the bowel on the left of the screen. Here's a positive male pelvis. Again, bladder in the middle of the screen with its smooth contours. Seminal vesicle appearing as a black triangle behind and to the right of the bladder. Free fluid appears in the abdomen to the left of the bladder. Notice again how the fluid makes sharp angles as it interfaces with the floating bowel on the left of the screen. Here's a challenge image of a male pelvis. What's going on? The bladders we have looked at thus far have taken on a range of shapes. They've been circular, square, or even triangular. However, one thing has remained the same. They have had smooth contours. After all, the bladder is a sac. You should not have things projecting into the bladder forming sharp angles. In this slide, we see an entirely decompressed bladder. Actually, the Foley balloon is seen along the right side of the image. It appears as a black circle. The black area in the center of the image is actually free fluid in the abdomen. Notice the sharp angles the fluid makes with the bowel floating in it, especially at the very top and left of the screen. Always be careful that what you're identifying as the bladder is indeed the bladder. Scan through it from side to side. If you're in doubt, use a Foley. Insert a Foley and drain the structure that you think may be the bladder, or fill the bladder to reintroduce it as a structure. The fourth view is the cardiac view. The pericardium is imaged for fluid around the heart, and the overall action of the heart is assessed. There are two approaches, subxiphoid or transthoracic. Starting subxiphoid, for this view, it is important to remember the heart lives in the chest, not the abdomen. The probe is placed below the xiphoid process, hand on top of the probe. Indicator towards the patient's right side. Face of the probe is angled toward the left chest. Probe is just about flat on the abdomen. This view can be enhanced by having the patient taking a deep breath. This flattens out the diaphragm, bringing the heart closer to the probe. 
The probe can also be shifted to the right to take advantage of the liver as an imaging window. This provides a four-chamber view of the heart. Top of the screen images the liver and caudal aspect of the heart closest to the probe. Bottom of the screen images the cephalad aspect of the heart furthest from the probe. Left of the screen is towards the patient's right. Right of the screen is towards the patient's left. Unfortunately, an air-filled stomach due to bagging may limit your ability to obtain a subxiphoid view. Here you need another approach. Parasternal or transthoracic view. Here the probe is placed to the left of the sternum, roughly nipple line. Indicator towards the patient's right shoulder, probe held vertically. This provides a three-chamber view of the heart. Top of the screen shows the anterior heart closest to the probe. Bottom of the screen shows the posterior heart, which is furthest from the probe. Left of the screen is towards the patient's right shoulder. Right of the screen is towards the patient's left hip. So what does a pericardial effusion look like? It appears as a black stripe of fluid encasing the heart. Its outer edge outlined by the white parietal layer of the pericardium. On the left of the slide, a sub view. Note the black rings surrounding the entire heart the largest area of fluid occurring at the top of the screen, the most dependent area of the heart. On the right, a parasternal view. The pericardial effusion is best seen at the bottom of the screen, this being the most dependent area of the heart. Notice that the fluid occurs in front of the descending aorta, seen in cross-section. One of the big mimickers of a pericardial effusion is an anterior fat pad. In the sub view, the fat pad occurs between the liver and heart and can be quite large. It typically appears gray with white dots within it, but sometimes can appear black. Unlike a pericardial effusion, a fat pad never wraps around the apex of the heart. A fat pad will generally narrow towards the apex of the heart, where pericardial effusion will broaden near the apex, given this is the most redundant area of the pericardium. Fat pads point out the importance of ensuring what you're identifying as a pericardial effusion truly wraps around the heart. The presence of any effusion should be confirmed in two views if possible. To close, we will cover the evaluation for pneumothorax. For superior imaging, consider switching to a linear probe. The probe is placed mid-clavicular line, just below the clavicle, indicator toward the head. In this orientation, the anterior chest appears at the top of the screen. The lung cavity occupies the bottom of the screen. Left of the screen is cephalad. Right of the screen is caudal. Subcutaneous tissue appears at the top of the screen. Under this is chest wall muscle. Then you see two ribs and their corresponding shadows. These ribs landmark the pleural line, a bright white line between the ribs. The presence of two findings at the pleural line exclude pneumothorax. First, the appearance of sliding or movement at the pleural line. Second is comatales, or ring-down artifact, transient streaks of white that come down from the pleural line. On the left is a film clip of a normal lung. On the right is a pneumothorax. Notice on the right that the pleural line does not shimmer or move. There are no transient white streaks or comatales coming down from this line. Note the value of this exam lies in its negative predictive value. Blebs in a COPD, scarring, or right main stem intubation can mimic a pneumothorax. So how to apply this clinically? Stable vital signs in a positive EFAST equals imaging to refine management. Is the hemothorax or pneumothorax large enough to require a chest tube? Is there a blush for angio? What do the Hounsfield units indicate about that blunt pericardial effusion? Stable vital signs in a negative fast determine your need for imaging based on the clinical picture. Unstable vital signs in a positive fast means OR for hemoperitoneum, chest tube for hemothorax or pneumothorax, and emergent pericardial window for pericardial effusion. Unstable vital signs and a negative fast consider other etiologies. Take home. Carefully explore each region during the fast, back to front, side to side, so as not to miss more subtle findings, and try to develop a three-dimensional understanding of the structural relationships present in each view. 
Thank you for your attention.